Hello and welcome to another Bible teaching. Um, today we're going to be looking at some questions that somebody gave me and I, I question the nature of their questions. I think it's somebody that just wants to debate pre-trib versus mid-trib uh, rapture. And um, I could tell that by their tone because they just wanted me to, they had four questions and just answer each with one simple Bible verse. Why can't you do it? And if you can't do that, why are you teaching? You know that it's a, that's a setup. You know, Christians don't talk to Christians that way. Anyhow, um, before I get into these questions, I want to uh, thank Phil Armstrong. Um, we had a, a brother in Christ, oh my goodness. You know, I was kind of leery when I got a text asking him to do a live uh, stream with him. And we talked on the phone. It's like we've known each other forever. I guess we have, you know, we're brothers in Christ. And so we, I did that. It's got a really good response. I've you know, had people ask me questions, had a lot of conversations with people that had questions. And it was really, really cool. So I uh, suggest that you check out Phil Armstrong and his um, uh, YouTube channel, you know, follow him. He's got some good stuff on there. That video is on there, uh, the, you know, the live feed video. And it's also on my channel too. So check it out. It's, it's good stuff. But this guy asked me four questions. Um, T. McGee, M-C-G-E. And I thank him. Um, he wouldn't like these answers, I don't think, but I'm going to go ahead and answer them. And he had give me four questions. How many times does the Lord return? When are the dead judged? When is the seventh trumpet? And when is the last trumpet? I mean, I could have given really short answers and everything, and it's not going to be understandable. And some of the stuff you have, you have to have Hebraic understanding to understand anything, especially the last trumpet. Um, you know, I've done a video on this. You know, you look at First Thessalonians 5, 1, where Paul is telling everybody that, you know, about the times and the seasons, in other words, the feast days and all the Hebraic stuff, I have no need to tell you because his audience understood it. Much of my audience does not. And the world today does not. Just Not just my audience, but the world today. So let's get right into it. How many times does the Lord return? Well, if you mean the Lord's returning on earth, once, only once, all right? And we're going to read about it in a couple verses. Um, first, Acts 111, where it is uh, predicted, forecast, prognosticated. Acts 111, um, Yeshua has just ascended up to heaven. And the angel, and they're sitting there gawking like, well, he's gone, he's gone. And... Um, and it actually starting in verse 10. And while they looked steadily, fastly towards heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing into the air? He's gone. You know, he's gone. Why is he like sitting there looking in the air? So this same Jesus, who was taken up from, from you into heaven, Will, some, will so come in like manner as you saw him go. Where are they standing? They're on a, standing on the Temple Mount. And, and these two angels are telling them he's going to come back the exact same way. So let's see that. Let's go to Revelation 19, 11 through 6. And we, we see him coming back here, but there's other scriptures in the Old Testament that are going to give us a lot more detail to this. So we're going to look at several verses here. So we're going to go to Revelation 19, 11 through 6. You again, remember that the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. Um, and the so you've got a lot of times you've got to look at the New Testament, I mean the Old Testament, to get a fuller understanding. And we're going to be doing that a bit today. Revelation 19, verses 11 through 16. Um, now I saw, I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it, on him, was called Faithful and True, and in, and in righteousness he judges and makes wars. His eyes were like flames of, a flame of fires, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written on it that no one except... Um, no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a white robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and with it 
he should strike the nations and he himself will rule with a rod of iron. He treads, he himself treads the winepress of fierceness and wrath of the almighty God. And he has on his robe on and on his thigh, a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Um, I'm going to dig into this a little bit. There's so much in here. White horse. It's a second white horse. The Antichrist came as a, a fake messiah. Um, he was clothed in a robe dipped in blood. That's actually the tallit, that prayer shawl. And that's what, when you bury somebody, you would wrap that around his face. What blood is on that prayer shawl? That's the blood of Jesus. That's Yeshua's blood. Um, his name is called the Word of God. You automatically should think John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Yeshua is the Word. So if you look back at the Old Testament, who wrote it? Yeshua. He's the Word of God. Who wrote the uh, Torah? Yeshua. Jesus. He wrote it. He's the Word of God. Did it through um, the, the prophets of old. Um, did it through Moses, but he's the one that wrote it. Um Rules with a rod of iron. I got a, a I, I didn't look at this ahead of time, but let's go and look. I've got a little note here to go to Psalms uh, 2, 8, and 9. Ah, I know where we're going. And we're going to look at this verse a little later in Psalm. Psalms actually 2. This is Armageddon. Oh, did I miss it? No. And it's actually really funny what we're going to look at. Um, anyway, he says, ask me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance. So he's going to get the nations. They're going to be given to him and the ends of the earth for your possession. You know, the, when it says that, ask me and I will give you the nations for your possession. That's Psalm 110.1 and the ends of the earth for your possession. That's Isaiah 9, 6, I may have 6 through 1, but it's okay. It starts in chapter six, uh, 9, uh, verse 6. And you shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. So you're always, many times, and I don't know them all, whenever you see something like this in the New Testament, there's an Old Testament reference. And it's really cool when you can go back to them. Um, and he will have, okay. And he, he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of, of the Almighty God. This is actually a winepress. It's blood coming out. And it's full. Oh, my goodness. It's full at that time. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord and Lord. Again, th this is not a tattoo on his thigh. Um, the scripture tells you do not do tattoos. Um, and But, he, but the, again, the robe is his tallit. It's a prayer shawl that would come down to about his thigh. All right. So where else do we see this? Let's go to... Zechariah 14, 4 through 5. This is all the same event that we're reading about, but we're going to read about it in multiple places throughout Scripture. There's actually a lot of cool stuff in these questions that I'm answering. Um, and it's going to explain some things. I should have said this to start. The other questions were, when are the dead judged? When is the seventh trumpet? I know when you say, when is the seventh trumpet? There, and then the next question is, when is the last trumpet? They're alluding that the seventh trumpet is the last trumpet. It's not. And, but there, in the seventh trumpet, it talks like that's the rapture, and it looks like it. But we're going to see why it's not. Um, anyhow, where are we going again? I'm sorry, Zechariah 14. I start talking, and I, and I stop slipping. Okay, Zechariah 14, 4, through five, four and 5. Um, where do I want to start? Yeah, it's fine. Uh, four. And in that day, the last thousand years, starting with the rapture, in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. This is, the, this is going back to the ascension when he's coming back, which faces on the east. And the Mount of Olives will split in two from the east to the west, making a large valley. Half of the mountain shall move towards the north and half of it shall move towards the south. Why? Okay, it faces to the east of Jerusalem. So if you're looking to the west, you're looking at Jerusalem and he'd be coming in the eastern gate. See, Solomon, not Solomon, Solomon, 
but Salomon or whatever, the um, Muslim general for ways back, he understood that Yeshua was going to be coming in through the Eastern Gate and he put a graveyard there, big graveyard, thinking that, you know, a nice little Jewish boy like Yeshua is not going to walk through a graveyard. No problem for Yeshua. He's just going to be earthquakes and a split in two, He's going to walk right through and not bother that that earthquake because he would be ceremonially unclean if he went to a graveyard and couldn't enter the temple. Um says, then you shall flee through my mountain valley, for the mountain valley shall reach Azal, that's the Mount of Olives. Uh, yes, you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of, the, of Uzziah, the king of Judea. Um, thus, the Lord my God will come and all the saints with you. Again, that's Revelation 19, all the saints coming with him. But I love the way this says it. The Lord my God. Whenever you see Lord my God, those two words together, Lord and God together, oh my goodness, you know it's going to happen. But it says, will come, not might come, may come, will come, and all the saints with you. All right, after this, we want to go to Ezekiel 43, 1. Ezekiel 43, starting in verse 1. All right. Afterwards, he brought me to the gate, the gate that faces towards the east. That's the same gate that Yeshua was going to be coming in from. We saw that a little while ago in Zechariah. Behold, the glory of God. Who's the glory of God? What's the glory of God? That's the person, Yeshua, Jesus Christ of Israel came from the way of the east. His voice was like the sound of many waters and the earth. Actually, that when you see earth in the Old Testament, and the prophets, it's Israel generally. Um, shown in his, his glory. It was like the appearance of the vision that I had, that I saw, which when I came to the destroy the city, um, the visions were like the vision, da, 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 da. Anyhow, um, in verse four, and the glory of the Lord came into the temple by way of the gate that uh, faces towards the east. Realize that in, where was it? Ezekiel 10, is that it? Yeah, Ezekiel 10, verse 18. We're not going to go there. But that's when the glory of God said, nope, I'm out of here. Oh, my goodness, this place is wicked. Look at all these things they're doing. The glory of God had to leave the temple. And that was the first temple. The glory of God was not in the second temple. The glory of God has not been in the temple. The glory of God will not be here on earth until Yeshua walks into the temple at the end of the seven years of tribulation. And if you're interested in seeing about like the glory of God leaving the temple and seeing the charges against them, um, the charges are in Ezekiel 8. One of them is that they turn their back to gods and worship the sun. No wonder Rome changed the calendar to Sunday. All right. So question number two, when are the dead judged? Well, there's two judgings of the dead, but three times. Anyhow, let me try to explain that. Um, go to Daniel 12. Let's start there. Yep, that's way off. And Daniel 12. Kind of cool scripture. We're looking at verses 1 through 3. At that time, not today, tribulation. This is like the at that time, last day, that time. Um, and yeah, Michael will stand up. What's Michael? Michael leads God, uh, God's armies. So this is the time for war. He's going to stand up. And the great prince who stands watch over your sons of your people, over Israel. And there shall be a time of trouble. What's that? Time of trouble? That's the time of Jacob's trouble. You can look that up and read about it. That's tribulation. Actually, it's a much better term for tribulation than the word tribulation. A lot of people get confused with tribulation. I've had people get all upset, like, you know, you're missing the fact that there's tribulation already in Israel or in the, the Middle East and Africa and everything. Yeah, there is. There's been tribulation for a long, long time. But that's not tribulation. Just like the spirit of the Antichrist has been at work in the world for a long, 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 long time, but there will be an Antichrist. Okay? That's like the man, um, that there are many, many false prophets all over the place, and there have been false prophets for a long, 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 long time, but there will be a false prophet. Yeah, I just had to get that out. Anyhow, let's go back to this first. 
<clears throat> there will be a time of trouble such was never as excuse me such as never was since there was a nation even to that time and at that time your people will be delivered yeah that's when they say blessed is he who comes in the name of the lord um that's when they mourn for the one that they pierced um like one mourns for his only son um, but it's not everybody two-thirds of the jews get killed off that's a story all in itself oh my goodness that's actually a really cool story when you look at being refined by silver seven times. How many times were they like in captivity or like oppression by foreign countries? Six so far. And the tribulation will be seven, seven times. You refine silver seven times. What's its judgment? What's the purpose of judgment to bring repentance? It's at the end of the seventh time that Israel will repent. All right. Anyhow, everyone who's found written in the book, that's the Lamb's book of life. Yeah, the Jews get written there too. It doesn't matter. Quit dividing things up. This is for the Jews. This is for the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. It's more important to look at the parable of the wheat and tares. Wheat is the kingdom of heaven. Tares is Satan's kingdom. Which do you belong to? That's what's important. Anyhow, but many who sleep in the dust shall awake. These are the dead. This is the dead coming up. Some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightest of the firmaments. And those who turn uh, who turn many to righteousness, like the stars forever and ever. Hmm. I like the, the those that are those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament. I can't help thinking about um, Matthew five, when Jesus said, "If you follow if you follow Torah, you follow law, and teach others to do it, you will be greatest in the kingdom of heaven. If you don't do it, you're least in the kingdom of heaven." But you know this confuse this verse confused me for so long. I'm like thinking to myself. When are people raised up to everlasting life and to shame and everlasting contempt at the same time? When does that ever happen at the same time? It doesn't. These are two different times. What you see here is the Bema Seat Judgment and the White Throne Judgment. You want to be in the Bema Seat Judgment. You do not want to be in the White Throne Judgment. The white throne judgment is people getting tossed into the lake of fire. How do you get out of the lake of fire? You don't. You just don't want to go there. So let's go ahead and take a look at these two. I'm going to make sure I got something up before we do that. Let's go to Matthew 11, 1 through 6. Is the question, maybe give me a minute. Do I want to go there now? Yeah, you know what? Before we before we go, I'm going to jump back to the question about how many times does the Lord return. I want to go. I'm, I'm sorry, I missed a verse. I'd like to get to, and it's actually a really really cool verse when you understand it. So let's go to Matthew 11. And at this point in Matthew, John the Baptist is in jail, waiting to lose his head. Jesus just sent out his disciples by twos, and. John the Baptist's disciples come to Jesus. So we're going to read one through six here. I want to explain this. Now it came to pass when Jesus finished commanding his 12 disciples that he, um, that he departed from there to teach and preach in their cities. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, are you the coming one or do we look for another? Not are you the Messiah? Are you this? Are you the coming one? Somehow John, John the Baptist knew that there was still one to come. And Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John these things which you hear and see. The blind see and the lame walk, and the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Well, there's a lot of whole people in the world right now that are not blessed because they are offended by what Jesus teaches and because of him. All right. Um, understand that John the Baptist, it, there, there's scripture that says that he's like one of the greatest that ever came. Why? Well, he would have been Elijah who comes before the day of the Lord if they would have accepted Yeshua. They didn't. They corporately rejected them. I mean, God knew this from the beginning, but he had to have Elijah set up and ready to go. So they did, but he would have been Elijah. John the Baptist was from a sect, and there's lots of different sects in Israel um, at that day, For and they're all Jewish. And, and if you go back and you read like um, 
uh, Paul's confession in Acts 24, 14. Yeah, Paul went to confession. He wasn't Catholic, but he confessed. And he says, he's like, according to the way, which is a sect, or many see as a sect. So the way, the early church, was a sect of Judaism. You know, you had the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians. You also had a sect in that day called the Essenes, which John the Baptist was there. They thought the temple system was corrupt. Duh. You see that all. Just read the, the bad shepherds in Isaiah 56. It was corrupt. There were a lot of problems with it. And they had left Jerusalem, left the sect, and they went down to the desert somewhere. I want to say down by the Dead Sea. I could be wrong. Um, that's where he came out of the wilderness and, and everything. But they believed that there were two comings of the Messiah by reading the scriptures. And they were Messiah ben Joseph and Messiah ben David. So when you see in our scripture, they say, is this the son of David or is this the son of Joseph? They're not saying, is this the son of Joseph, the carpenter's son? Oh, carpenter. No, that's a bad word. Um, in, the, in, he, in, in the original text, the word there is builder. So in when they wrote the King James Bible, they said carpenter. You don't have a lot of trees in Israel. You got rocks. He was a, he was a stonemason. His dad was. Anyhow, so Jesus probably worked with his dad and was pretty strong himself. But um, so let me keep, and then the Messiah ben Joseph and the Messiah ben David. Messiah ben Joseph is the suffering lamb. We know from the crucifixion that Jesus was the lamb of God. Messiah ben David is the conquering king. And, you know, when he's coming in the triumphal entry on, on uh, Palm Sunday, who are they expecting to see? Messiah ben David. They were, they were mistaken. Wrong Messiah. Anyhow, I'm getting off task here. Um, so, but that tells you that there are two comings, a first and a second coming. So the rapture is really not a coming. So when the question was, are there, you know, how many times does uh, the Lord return? Well, he comes once and returns once. Although the rapture, he's caught up in the clouds. We get caught up in the clouds to him. He's, he's not coming to the earth. So that is not a coming. All right. I'm sorry. Let's go back to the second question. When are the dead judged? <laughs> We've got two judgings based on um, Revel I'm sorry, Daniel 12. We're looking at the, the Bema Seat judgment and the great white throne judgment. So let's start with and, and understand that and we talked about the lake of fire. How do you get out of it? You don't. Um, but what Daniel said is there's a resurrection to life and a resurrection to death, basically. So the resurrection to life is, and you, I automatically think of the great white throne judgment. This is where we receive our crowns. You'll see in the beginning part of Revelation, you have crowns, and there's like seven different crowns that you get for different things. One of them is for watching the for the glorious return of Jesus. Um, I'm going to get me that crown. Anyhow, let's go to, um, I got this backwards the way I did this, but we started on the beam of seat judgment, so we're going to do that. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3, starting in verse 11. You know, in some of my other videos, I talk about lawlessness and what the scripture says with lawlessness. This one says a little different. And I, I know that the scripture is not wrong. I just don't quite understand that 100%. And I'm still learning. I've never claimed to understand everything perfectly. Um, but I've learned quite a bit. And I just felt compelled to share. 1 Corinthians 3. And I'm still learning. Oh, my goodness, I'm still learning. Um, starting in verse 11. No, for no other foundation can be laid than the, with that which was laid, which is Jesus Christ. So Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, is our foundation. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw, each one's work will become clear for the day. Hmm, we'll declare it. What day? Um, that's the Lord, the day of the Lord. Actually, in my Bible, day is capitalized. It is a reference to Jesus Christ. The day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. What is fire? Whenever you see fire, yeah, it can be fire, but it's judgment. There is a judgment involved. When you see fire talked about many, many times, it's fire is representation of judgment. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. Does fire 
determine what kind of work something is? No, judgment does. This is a judgment. This is the Bema seat judgment. I still don't know why it's the Bema seat, but it is. That's what we call it. If anyone's work, which he has built on it, endures, he will receive a reward. Those, those rewards are the are the the um, crowns. And you want to get as many of those crowns as you can, because you're going to keep them forever and ever in eternity. And everybody's going to look at you and say, oh, my goodness, look at all the crowns he has. No. What are you going to do with the crowns? You're going to cast them off to Jesus. He's going to be coming back with many crowns. Why? We've cast them all off to him. If any work, okay, so which rewards there withstand fire? The gold, the silver, the precious stones, the wood, hay, and straw down. They're worthless for the kingdom. Um, all the money you make, the prestige you have at your job, the car, the house, whatever, that, that stuff means nothing. That stuff burns away. Anyhow, if anyone's work is burned, he, if anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? The bottom line is if you're in the Bema seat judgment, you're good. You're going in. And if you've been raptured, you're going in. This is when this happens. This is when you get the rewards because you see the crowns later and where the crowns show up. So this is right after the rapture. And if you don't have a whole lot of rewards and everything you got is wood, hay, and straw, and it burns up, if you're there, if you're truly saved and you're there, you're going to go in. You won't be harmed. You're going to smell smoky. This is what in our Bible study, we joke about this. You go in there smelling like smoke, people looking around like, ooh. Man, he's really smoky. He had a lot, a lot of stuff that didn't didn't amount to anything on him. It's kind of a joke. There's nothing in the Bible that says we're going to smell smoky. Anyhow, um, so let's look at, there's another time, though, where believers are judged and they get to go in. But it's all part of the resurrection to life. Um, see, here's a concept you need to understand with the resurrection of life. And the rapture is an event on the resurrection of life. I'm going to pause real quick. I want to find a particular verse. I'll be right. Okay. As I was saying, the um, rapture is an event on the resurrection to life. Throughout the, throughout scripture, we will see a lot of verses referring to like uh, people being saved or whatever in the terms of agriculture, of sowing and reaping. Even if you go back into Leviticus 23, where it's talking about how Jesus went, and, and Leviticus 23 is spring and fall feast days. He fulfilled all the spring feast days. He will fulfill the fall feast days, and they are in order. And Rosh Hashanah is rapture, if you understand your feast days. But in between, there's one verse that doesn't seem like it belongs there. Uh, Leviticus, I believe, is 23, 22, and it's saying like, um, when you harvest the field, don't harvest the corners, don't pick up the gleanings, the stuff that falls, leave those for the poor and the stranger among you. Um, so it's about agriculture. See, when you harvest, um, and you've got to, if you're not clicking harvest things, you need to read the Bible more. But anyhow, when you harvest, there are the first fruits. Okay. There is the main harvest, and then there's the gleanings, going back and picking up the stuff you didn't. Well, the first fruits was when Yeshua rose. He arose on the feast of first fruits. He's the, the first fruits of the resurrection of life. Um, and let me read something that, about that. And we're in Matthew 27, starting in verse 50. And Jesus cried out. What did he cry out? It is finished. Cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the, the temple was torn in two from top to bottom and the earth quaked and the rocks were split and the graves were open and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the graves after his resurrection they went into the holy city and appeared to many people this one bothered me for a long time okay you got a bunch of ghosts they went down they haunted the city these people came out of the grave and matthew's only when it writes about it but it's just kind of weird until you realize that on his resurrection Okay. <clears throat> On the feast of first fruits, you come in to the temple and you have like a sheet of wheat and you're waving it. Um, pretty sure that's where it went in. Anyhow, if it, it's sheep, many stalks. If it was one stalk, it would have been just one person. Jesus would have rose by himself. But since you're doing many, 
people had to arise with him. Paul later writes that he is the first fruits of the resurrection of life. He arose on the feast of first fruits. He was the first fruits to the resurrection of life, the beginning of the harvest. The rapture is the main event. Okay. And then you have the gleanings. Where do you see the gleanings? That would be in, eh, it's Revelation. We're going to, oh, where did I write it? Give me a second. Revelation 20, verse 4. Actually, it's probably good we say it this way from being Revelation for the great white throne judgment. Revelation 20, verse 4. All right. And I saw the thrones and they sat on them. This is um, this is a great white throne judgment. Judgment was committed to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded. Um, I'll take it back. This is not the great white throne judgment. My apologies. Um, when I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads and on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So this is this is the gleanings. This is picking up everybody's left. And if you understand Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah rapture is a day of judgment and that everybody's judged because not everybody's truly good or truly evil. You got 10 more days to get right with God. Revelation 2.10, you'll have tribulation for 10 days. Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is the final judgment. That's the end of the seven years of tribulation. Um, so then, so that's that's the resurrection to life. You have the first fruits, Christ, and all of those people that rose with him and haunted the city and all that. That's the first fruits. You have the main event, the rapture, which I'm not really going into here. I do that in all my other videos. And you have the, and actually we will see the rapture a little bit later when I answer one of the other questions. Um, and then you have the great white throne judgment. And that is, I'm sorry, then you have the gleanings, those people that didn't take the mark of the beast. So there's your resurrection to life. Now, the great white throne judgment is right here in Revelation 20. And we're going to start in, first I wanted to read one through six. And just to give you some time frame, rather than reading, I'm just going to go ahead and give it to you. Um, Satan's bound up for a thousand years. Uh, by some no-name angel, it's not Michael, it's not Gabriel, just God just like Jesus says, um, hey, you, you over there, angel, go lock him up for a thousand years because they got caught. In the, and the, um, and he gets locked up for a thousand years. And uh, the beast, excuse me, that's the beast, and the false prophet and the uh, antichrist get thrown into the lake of fire. They're the first fruits to the resurrection of death. Okay. Um, and then it says that, the, you know, the, the people that received the mark of the beast, that didn't take the mark of the beast, come back to life. And then it says that the rest did not come back to life till the thousand years was over. Okay, now it's in verse 7. When the thousand years had expired, Satan will be released from prison. I always got, I got questions about this one. And it's nothing that I've seen in scripture where I've got answers really, but who knows, maybe one day God will reveal something in scripture to me. Now, when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth. Um, Gog and Magog to gather them together to battle. I thought all of Gog and Magog got buried already. Hmm, maybe Ezekiel 39 could be part of this battle. I don't know. Not 100% positive on that. Um, to gather them to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. How can so many people in a thousand years get so deceived when Yeshua is still reigning in Jerusalem? That, the, you know, that multitudes of people come against Jesus. But that's what happens. They went up on the breath of the earth and surrounded the camp of Israel, of the saints, and the beloved city, uh, Jerusalem. And the fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone uh, where the uh, beast and the false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Hmm. That don't sound like a place I want to be. Tormented forever and ever. I don't want to be there. 
You know, if, if you're questioning which, which way you want to go and you're just curious about end times and you stumbled upon this video, um, do you want to be tormented forever and ever in a lake of fire? It doesn't sound good. Anyhow, let's keep reading. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it. And I'm sorry, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled. And there were, uh, I'm sorry, and there were found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great. That's young and old. That's a Jewish idiom. It is. That's how you know that this book was written in Hebrew. Really? Yeah, we'll get to that in a minute. The book of Revelation was first written in Hebrew. A little, a little later, I'm going to show you a couple things. Um, anyhow, I saw the, the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were open. Books, plural. Why books? Plural. There are three books. Um, Hebraic understanding. You know, if you don't have it, you don't have it. And you just say, you read it and you think book of life. And that's all you're thinking. Maybe the book of life is in all these different books. There's the book of life, the book of deeds, and the book of law, Deuteronomy. Um, if you're not found in the book of life, then you're judged by the book of deeds and the book of law. Nobody can pass that judgment. The law was never intended to save anybody from the get-go. Read through, if you don't believe I'm saying what I'm saying, read through Deuteronomy 28. And when you read through Deuteronomy 28, what you will see is it's about blesses and curses to following the law. And there is nothing in there that's eternal. It was by, Yeshua was the way to salvation from the very beginning. There, there, there were just a lot of bad shepherds. And there still are. And yeah, the books were open. Another, and Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things that were written in the books, okay, by their works, because they weren't in the book of life. And sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. It's saying that over and over. You know, he's making a point. They're being judged by their works. Then death and Hades were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. If anyone not found in the if anyone not found written in the book of life was cast in and anyone that's why it wasn't making sense and anyone not found in the written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So there you have it. There's your judgments. The times that the dead are judged. Um, you know, a couple of thoughts to think about. You know, the, the people who were live and raptured. You know, they're going to be judged in the Bema Seat judgment, too. But you're also going to have, there's some other people getting into heaven. Um, and we're not going into it here. I've got videos on it. But there are Jews that will be hidden away in Petra. Halfway through tribulation, they're woken up. Some event wakes them up. I believe it's Gog and Magog. They realize they're going to read Revelation 12. They're going to realize it's time to go to heaven. They're repenting. And... Uh, God's going to look out for them and send them and protect them in Petra. They're going to walk live into the kingdom of heaven. All right. Our next question. What is the next question we have here? Oh, when is the seventh trump? Uh, well, the easy one is right after the sixth trump. All right. Let's move on. No, no, no. This I'm going to spend some time on. Um, the seventh trump is... Right, the midpoint of tribulation. This is where you a lot of the mid trib mid tribulation believers believe that they're going up, and there's some things that need to be said here. Um, understand that yes, the Book of Revelation is written in Hebrew. Okay, and if you look at the word Alleluia, it's a transfigure a transliteration. In Greek, there is no word for hallelujah, hallelujah. So it's a transfiguration. If you if you look it up, it's just going to say it comes from Hebraic origin. All right, another one. Turn to Revelation 10, verse 1. Talking about the, the, the mighty angel with the little book. And, you know, this is one. I'm going to dig into that one day and dig in more into the Revelation. I spend a lot of my time in the prophets. I mean, I used to spend a lot of time in Revelation, but I spend most of my time in the prophets. And, you know, I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with white. A rainbow was on his head, and his face was like the sun, and his, his feet were like pillars of fire. I've seen people with some pretty big feet. I have big feet. 
My feet are size 13. I've met people with bigger feet than me. I have never seen a feet or foot that looks like a pillar. How can that be? In Greek, just like in English, a foot is just the foot. What you think of when you think of foot, you know, below the ankle. In Hebrew, the foot goes up to the knee. The hand goes up to the elbow. Think about when Christ was crucified and it's in the hand and in the feet where the spikes went in. If the spike was in your hand, it would probably pull through. In the wrist, that's not part of the hand. In the wrist, which is part of the hand in Hebrew, it wouldn't pull through. This is a thought. But, um, and we will see things in here like something saying and then saying something, and we're going to see that in a little bit. That's how they wrote in Hebrew. All right, so Book of Revelation was written in Hebrew. And it's important because as we get into the seventh trumpet, and we're looking at Revelation 11, where we see the seventh trumpet, and I'm going to start reading. And, you know, this is the midpoint in tribulation. From everything is pretty much chronological in in, in its origin, you, know, you have the, the, the seals, the trumpets, and then the bold judgments. But from the beginning of 10 to 11.4 or 11.10, 11, um, that is sort of an interlude, a little like parentheses and something in the middle because those things take a lot of time or cover a lot of different time. And then actually down to 14. And then when we get into the seventh trumpet, you're back on that timeline. And this is right about the midpoint of tribulation. So let's read. The seventh, the seventh angel sounded. And there were loud voices in the heaven. Notice it's not a trumpet of God or anything. It's just the seventh angel sounded. And there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of the world have become the kingdoms of the Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forevermore forever and ever. Is Christ reigning at this point? No. We, we've looked at all the verses before. Christ is not reigning on, to, on earth and, and the kingdom of, of heaven, excuse me, the kingdom of earth, the kingdoms of this world. He's not reigning there until the glory of God walks in through that eastern gate. But this says, this says flat out, you know, not, I mean, obviously you can read that. The kingdoms of the world have become. It already happened. When the readiness has already happened. That's when you need to understand Hebraic verbs. And I am not, I, English was not a good topic for me. Um, I mean, I did all right. Math, I was more of a math guy. But Hebrew is even harder. Because the verbs in Hebrew get really tense. Um, and what I mean by that is, and you cannot see it in English, you can see it in Hebrew. And I don't read Hebrew. I have a teacher that does. And he explains these things. Um, John1415.org, Creekside Messianic, one of the best teachers of the word out there. Check it out. All right. This is what you would call a, let me see if I get the right word here. Um a prophetic, oh, I'm sorry, give me a second. It is a prophetic perfect tense, okay? In fact, this is a prophecy of what's happening. God is declaring, Jesus is declaring that I will take back everything. He doesn't say that because this is so assured, so positive, so much that this is going to happen, you write it as if it already happened. It, in the Hebrew, it's known as a prophetic perfect tense, a tense with a verb. See, in the verbs, like a lot of the stuff in, in Deuteronomy, and I have trouble with this, and I mean, I have to go back and do research on stuff, but there are verbs that mean it's forever. Some of the commands are, per, are permanent. Some of the commands are temporary. Some of them are, I'm going to do this, the prophetic perfect, like we see here. And it supposedly, if you read and understand Hebrew, it jumps out at you. And I've spoken to people, some of my customers, Orthodox Jews who read Hebrew, and they're saying it's even hard for them to pick all of it out. 
But that's what it is. God is declaring that I'm going to take that. Okay. If it had already happened, why is why is he still pouring out all the bold judgments? Why do you have three and a half years of tribulation, the great tribulation? Yeah. If God has declared it, if, if it has happened and, and, and Jesus is like Lord of the kingdom here, why hasn't, why is he going to do that? Because it hasn't happened yet. And that's what I want to dig into. And I know I may have said some things that bother you, but understand that right after this, he's making a declaration that I am taking it back. All right. What happens next? War breaks out in heaven. Revelation 12. Satan don't like that. He wants to take it back. I need to get into my notes here and make sure I'm going the right way. Um, so this definitely was written in Hebrew. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going over here. And he says that he shall reign forever. We see that in Ezekiel 36, um, Ezekiel 46, where it says once he walks into the temple that he will reign there forevermore. Um, don't want to go. I was going to go longer into like some stuff in the Old Testament. I'm going to try to cut it down. Um, you look at the fourth, um, the Daniel 2 and the, and the statue, the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. Um, and it, it's, you know, you have Babylon, Medo-Persian Empire, um, Greece, and the feet are um, Greece, and then you have, I'm sorry, Rome. And the stone that was cut without human hands crushes all of that system. Who is that stone? That's the stone the builders rejected. That's Yeshua. It's actually, it's in the Old Testament when... Um, it's in the Old Testament that the stone is the Messiah. And that's when the, the times of the Gentiles end, when everything comes crashing down. Now, I actually think the toes, and a lot of people say the toes of the Revived Roman Empire. I think it's a little more than that. I believe the toes are the 10 kings that have yet to receive a kingdom, that it's a new world order, a one world government, and that they're going to break up the world into 10 regional governments. But that's irrelevant here. Um, but see, that's when Yeshua takes back everything, when the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. That's not until he comes back with a sword coming out of his mouth. Um, in Daniel 7, let's go there, 3 and 4. Daniel 7, 3 and 4. Um, I'll give it back 13, 14, my apologies. I was watching in the night visions and behold, one like the son of man. Actually, this, if you read about, if you read it, you know, it's Yeshua, you know, it's the Messiah. But in the Hebrew, this screams flesh, Adam, the son of Adam, so that the, the Messiah is coming in the flesh. Um, anyhow, coming with the clouds of heaven. That's Revelation 19.11. You see it in Matthew 24. That's not a rapture in Matthew 24. He came to the Ancient of Days. He is the Messiah. Ancient of Days is God the Father. And they brought him near before him. Then he was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. That's the end of tribulation. That's when Christ is reigning. Um, you know, I, I, I can't help but think of Psalm 110.1. That all the people's languages have served him, uh, Revelation 5, 9, and 10. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the one that shall not be destroyed, uh, Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. If midpoint through the tribulation, if this has been fulfilled and he has the kingdom at that point, it's going to get destroyed. And is it the sixth? bowl when you have the major earthquake and everything gets just rocked and destroyed which goes to isaiah but the earth will reel like a drunkard all right so so in, in a way i'm like sitting here saying that it, this earth is satan's kingdom all right it is it is for now it will end he don't like it and that's why war breaks out in heaven he doesn't like that yeshua is claiming proclaiming that he's going to take it back 
and he does. He doesn't like it. That's why war breaks out in heaven and, Re and Revelation 12. But turn with me to Matthew 4 real quick. And it's interesting because in math, at the time I'm recording that, we have just entered into Teshuva, 40 days of prayer and repentance that leads up to Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur, the days of all, the time that book ends, um, Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur, the time that book ends tribulation. And this is all about prayer and repentance and turning to God. And this is when Yeshua is in the desert or in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted. And we're not going to go to that whole story because I don't want this to be longer than it has to be. And I'm not good at doing short videos because there's, there's so much to, to explain, so much to fill in, so many really cool little facts and details. It's kind of cool. I love it. Uh, Matthew 4, 8 and 9. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. What does Jesus say? What does Yeshua say? What do you mean you're going to give it to me? It's already mine. You can't give me what already belongs to me. This is mine. No, he doesn't say that. What does he say? Away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. He didn't say this is not yours to give because at that point, Satan's in control. He still is. He will be until Yeshua takes back his kingdom. Give me a second here. And that is not the seventh trumpet. And the reason this is important and the reason I spend so much time on this is when you get into that seventh trumpet, people are sitting there and saying, see, I told you this is the rapture. This is the rapture. And I, I've had trouble explaining this in the past, um, but it's actually pretty cool. Let's keep reading down in, in, in um, Revelation 11 real quick, and I'll try to do this quickly. We give you thanks. I'm sorry, in the 16, in the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones and their face, faces of worship God saying, we give thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and was and is to come because you have taken your great power and reigned. Again, this is prophetic. I mean, this is the, um, you know, I, I, I twist words and miss words and forget words all the time. This is the prophetic perfect. This is where you're declaring something is going to happen. Has he taken control yet? No. He doesn't take control until he comes back on a white horse and he, and he wipes everybody out. That's when he takes control. We're going to look at that in a minute because of what's in here. And it's actually pretty cool. This is, to me is really cool to get this understanding, what I'm about to teach. Because you have taken great power and reign. The nations were angry and your wrath has come. And the time of the dead that they shall be judged. Let's go to right here where, and it says, yeah, the dead will be judged. The dead aren't judged till later. We saw that already. It's not judged at the seventh. The dead are not judged at the seventh trumpet. They're not. You know, we've seen that. Um, and they get the rewards. Again, this is all written in the prophetic perfect. Um, let's look at Psalm 2. Psalm 2 is about Armageddon. Oh, give me, here we go. This is Armageddon. Why do the nations rage and plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves up, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord. And his annoying saying, let's break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. This is Armageddon. Everybody gathered in the uh, Valley of Megiddo, Armageddon, and they got unbelievable amount of armies okay unbelievable amount of armies and um they're saying we don't want you to reign we know you're coming back we will stop you we will destroy you okay and it says and then it's actually even funnier in joel 3 and i'm working through a, a teaching thing on joel take me a little longer than i thought but that's okay um 
And Joel 3, God's mocking him. Bring everybody you got. He actually says, beat your plowshares into spears, the opposite of what we see in the millennial kingdom. He's saying, bring every tool, every weapon, bring it on. Come on. He's not worried about it. He's not afraid of what's going to happen in Armageddon. He knows. All right. And it says, and it's funny here because it says, he who sits in heaven laughs. And the Lord shall hold them in derision. That's like a ridiculing mock, laughing. He's like, look at these people. Oh my goodness, they think they're going to stop me? You know? And he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in deep pleasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill, Zion. That's when Christ is sitting on the thing, on the on the uh, temple. He shall speak in his wrath. Okay, when Christ comes back on a white horse, when Yeshua comes back on a white horse, got a sword coming out of his mouth, is it going to be like a big bloodshed battle, guns and this and all this other stuff? No, 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 it's not. Our weapons are not the weapons of this world. They're spiritual in nature. It's the word of God, which is sharper than any two-edged sword. So the word, the, the, the sword coming out of his mouth, is there a little sword coming out of the mouth? I don't know. I don't think so. Could be, but the, the sword is the word. So let's see exactly what's going to happen to that when that happens. So we want to go to Zechariah. I'm just trying to look, find my verse here. Sorry about that. Yeah. We go to Zechariah 14, chapter 12. And this is um, Christ coming to battle. And it's actually really cool. But um, and it says, and this shall be the plague with which the Lord will strike all the people who fought against Jerusalem. This is Armageddon. Their flesh shall dissolve while they stand on their feet and their eyes shall dissolve in their sockets and their tongue shall dissolve in, the mat, in their mouth and it shall come to the okay, cave and it goes on and on think back to Raiders of the Lost Ark you know when they, they finally get in that cave or whatever it is and they've got the, the Ark of the Covenant and they go to open it and everybody just sort of dissolves away where do you think Steven Spielberg a Jew got that idea it's right here Armageddon is going to be over in an instant we're coming with him on, on our horses dressed in white. We ain't getting our robes dirty. Uh -uh. We're just witnesses to what he's going to do with, the, with the, the, the sword, the word of God. All right. Our next question. Let me go back to my list of questions here. How many times does the Lord return? We covered it. When are the dead judged? We covered it. When is the seventh trumpet? We covered it. Midpoint of tribulation. But... You know, thing is, if I had just answered with one little verse, I'm being set up to try to say, see, it's this and that and whatever, and for him to go off. And I could tell by the tone of this guy that it wasn't, he wasn't looking for understanding. He was looking to set me up to, to, um, to try to prove that I'm wrong. And, you know, it's not about me being wrong or him being wrong or whatever. It's what does the word of God say? And you can't always do that in one little verse because everything builds on each other. Um, the last question was, when is the last trump? And he's going to sit here and tell you, that's it, the seventh trumpet. That's the last trump. See, there's the rapture. There is nothing in the seventh trumpet about the rapture. These are all prophetic perfects about what God is going to do. If God had done it at that point, because it said he already did it, and that's what a prophetic perfect is. It's so sure that it's going to happen. You write it as if it already happened. Um, why do you need the bold judgments? If God had already set up his kingdom and took everything back, why do you need the bold judgments? Think about it. All right. So let's look at the last trump. And there, you know, okay, there is a, there is a verse. It's that Paul spoke and he talks about the rapture being the last trump and a twinkling of an eye. That's about all we got. See, this is where you got to understand the Hebraic feast days and everything. Rosh Hashanah, 
100 trumpets, 100 blows of the sharp fires, nine sets of 11, and one last trump. And somebody's going to say, why does the rapture, a Christian event, have to happen on a Jewish feast day? Leviticus 23, these are the feast days of the Lord. They are my feast days. They're not Jewish, they're God's. But the rapture is a, a Christian event. Only Christians are going. Here in Isaiah, Isaiah 20, um, I'm sorry, Isaiah 26. I know we've been here before. It's a verse about the rapture. I want to bring out one little part. Your dead, starting in verse 19, your dead shall live together with my dead body. Keep read, read all the way through for yourself to the end of the uh, chapter 26, and you will see that this is definitely the rapture. What is Isaiah saying? Your dead shall live together with my dead body. Isaiah saying, I'm going. Isaiah saying, when the rapture happens, I'm one of those dead. They're going to come out of the ground and rejoice because I'm going. Hmm. Isaiah is about as Jewish as you get. How is that a Christian event? Again, the divide is not Jew, Gentile, rich, poor, old, young, whatever. The divide is, do you belong to Yeshua or do you belong to Satan? And it's time to find out because those judgments are not that far off. God bless you. Got questions? Ask. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you made it this far. Clock's ticking, running out of time. Got to have Yeshua. Got to share Yeshua. If, if you're following end times and you're understanding stuff out of prophecy and you're not actively sharing Jesus with people, you're not actually sharing the Lord, Yeshua, Him, Mashiach with people, you need to be doing things differently. God bless you. Shalom.